welcome, Melanie, to uh, the podcast. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So for all the guests watching, this is Melanie Smith from Solo Select Quarter Horses. Mm -hmm. That's correct the way of saying your company? Solo Select Horses. Solo Select Horses. Yes. Okay. So this whole podcast was about me interviewing people that have been very successful in their field. It wasn't necessarily designed to be a horse podcast or the horse industry, but everybody's got a unique story of where they started from. And especially what turns me on is people starting from nothing, being you know poor, not a lot of resources, and through hard work, determination, grit, um, risk, luck, a little bit of everything mixed together, they became very successful or were the best at what they do in a particular industry. And I want to learn about trials and tribulations, what worked, what didn't work, what sucked, if you had to go back and do it again. And I want people to watch the podcast and say, I can do it. I don't have to have the resources, but I can still be number one with, with these ingredients and so forth. So sure. here's what I've admired about what you've done. You've pretty much, it's always the same thing, is that it always seems like, it, it, you know, Everybody always feels like when people become popular, it's an overnight success. Yes. But it's anything but overnight success. You've been doing it for many, many years, but people think it's an overnight success because it kind of blows up, okay? Right. I'll start out by saying this. So if you would have told me 10 years ago, literally, that people would buy horses off the internet, and I'm not talking about a $3,000 horse. I'm talking about a $100,000 horse, $200,000 horse, $300,000 horse. They would buy it off the internet, an internet sale, an auction online, mm -hmm. not know who they're bidding against, yeah. not ridden the horse, not seen the horse, not touched the horse, yeah. not done anything that is traditional as a horseman has done for hundreds of years, gone to the place where the horse is, sure. seen it, talked to the owner, talked to the previous owner, got his hands on it, let their bet look at it. I would say that'll never work in a million years. I would have bet a million dollars, and I'm glad I didn't because I, I would have lost. <laughs> I would have lost my ass. Okay, but you've not only done it; you've blown it out of the water, and that to me is very intriguing. Mm -hmm. Part of it makes me feel old because it's like <laughs> I don't have the balls to do it. Yeah. But part of it also says there's a reason why this must work because people must feel confident to go do it. Because me as a horseman, I would I've never done that. You know what I mean? Maybe a broodmare or something like that I would have felt comfortable sure. doing. You know what I mean? But a riding horse, a young horse, anything like that, traditionally horsemen have just not done this, okay? okay. So I want to know, the first question I want to know, and we're going to walk into your history of horses and so forth, what made you realize that there was, because traditionally, let's just be honest, the horse industry is prehistoric as a general rule. They're Absolutely. 30 years behind everything else, yes. which to me, I love it because like, I'll come out with cool shit. It's just stuff from other industries. Mm -hmm. Like I'll go to yachting expos, plane expos. Right. I'll go to equine, uh, not equine. I'll go to expos of different industries. Yep. For two or three days, I'll walk around, look at the booths, look at the vendors, talk to people. And it's amazing how many ideas you can get you bring them back to the horse world, everybody thinks you reinvented the wheel. It's been out there forever, but the horse industry is always so backwards. Mm -hmm. And that's just being honest. It's yes. 30 years behind the rest of America right. that it seems like it's new. Mm -hmm. So historically, people have, you know, long before the internet, people had to go to breeding facilities to go buy horses. You know, right. you had all the big ranches, you know, cow rows and and Babcock quarter horses and, mm -hmm. and all the others in different industries, racehorse breeding, et cetera, people would fly in from all over the world to go look at their horses. You go out in the pasture. That's how it was done forever. Right. What made you rethink or have the balls to say, there's another way of doing this? What gave you that idea? Because it never would have crossed my mind. So I started selling horses in college, right? Just to get through college and make some extra money. And I sold them on the internet, and that was when you say internet, Facebook. Like that what was ten years ago. So we used to post them on like Dream Horse and Ranch World ads. Like in my like that was the beginning of all of it, right? Yes. Facebook was just starting. So we started like I would put them on Ranch World ads or Dream Horse or something like that. You would get the phone calls, and then people still usually came and looked at them. So that was like ten years ago. Yeah. Um, and then and I know we'll get into the history of all of it later, it kind of evolved over COVID is when it really happened. Ah. Like, so I'm selling horses on Facebook and primarily only Facebook, doing these Facebook auctions. It was 
it was a uh, very unsophisticated but effective way to sell horses, okay? It worked. It, it, worked yes. uh, it turned into a huge business. Then in COVID, I woke, I literally woke up one day and said, it, the horse industry is about to change. Yeah. I think this online deal is because all the other horse sales, like they're canceling live horse sales, right? And I'm like, all these people need to buy a horse. They're bored out of their minds. Yes. They are looking to buy a horse right now. Like, I think it's going to take off and we're going to start an online horse sale. That's awesome. And I just woke up one day and said, this is, this is what I want to do. I found the website I wanted to use and had it set up and we had a sale about 30 days later. And it was incredible. Like the first sale was off the charts. See, you've got a natural gift for being able to look at an industry and see what's about to die and where it's going to go. Yep. Okay. Meaning that. The money never stops flowing, but what it does is goes in different channels. Sure. So, so, you know, I, I always remember this one time, you know, 15 years ago, I read in a magazine, Quarter Horse Magazine, somebody was interviewing Carol Rose, and, and they said about, you know, Quarter Horse breed confirmations changed over the years and bloodlines and breeding and so forth. And, and somebody said to Carol, they said something along the lines of, you know, um, you know, it's a lot of people don't like the modern quarter horse. You know, they say its feet are too small or this or that or whatever. You know, how do you feel about breeding horses? And her basic response was, you can be die hard and think that a purple horse is the best horse. Mm -hmm. And you can keep breeding purple horses. But if the public want to buy orange horses, you're either going to breed orange horses and sell them or you're going to keep breeding purple horses and you're just going to have a pasture full of purple horses. Yes. So you can either adapt and change mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. You might truly like purple horses better sure. than orange ones. But if a public want freaking orange horses, you better sure shit breed them because that's what they want to buy. Absolutely. So if you don't change, you become a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. You know, I went through it with, with uh, magazines, equine expos, VHS tapes, <laughs> DVDs, now streaming. Mm -hmm. online. So I've always had an ability to be able to predict where things are going for my business. Okay, this is coming to an end. Where am I going next? Like, I, you know, for 15 years, RFD TV drove my whole business. If you would have told me halfway through the 15 years that one day I'd get off RFD TV, I'd say, you're fucking nuts. I'm yeah. never getting off this thing. It's a cash cow. It just brings in so much money. But I saw the last two or three years that thing was dropping off mm -hmm. and I needed to find a new racehorse to get on that was going to take me over the rest of the finish line. And now we don't do anything on RFT. Everything's through, you know, YouTube, Facebook, um, social media, Instagram, Twitter, shit, all the rest of them. Sure. It's all out there. That's where we do our marketing now. Right. No, virtually no magazines. Where 20 years ago, everything was through the magazines. Yep. Now I probably spend 10,000 on magazines, where at one point I spent 750,000 on magazines. So everything changes. You yep. either change with it That's exactly and adapt right. and the money will flow, mm -hmm. or you stick your head in the sand or become belligerent and indignant about it and you fucking die. That's yeah. as simple as it gets. So you you obviously saw there was a change there. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to that. So so if you had to sum it up before we get into the history of you, basically you, in your words, what is Solo Select? What are you? What For people that are not horse people, what is your business? So my business is primarily having a horse sale, an online sale, and we'll have a sale every two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, we will sell anywhere from 30 to 100 horses in each sale. So that would be the primary part of my business. Okay. Um, and, I, and these are quarter horses, These correct? are a little of everything. Okay. Like our last sale, we had quarter horses, we had paints, and we even had some thoroughbred mares that mm -hmm. we put with breeding star studs. Okay. So um, I would say stock horses. Right. Okay, but, um, but we do dabble in a little of everything from race horses to cow horses to rope horses, et cetera. Um, Probably it's coming up close where it's 50 50. Um, the breeding has gotten huge at my mm -hmm. house. So we went from two years ago breeding 30 outside mares to last year we probably managed, uh, not including our own, 80 outside mares. And this year I think we'll have close to 200 okay. plus my own mares. Right. So um, the breeding has gotten big, but once again, we have tried to grow with the breeding industry because it's changing rapidly. So we have tried to offer the ICSI services to our customers in a way that's easy for them to understand and not a lot of work for them to manage. Okay. So that's Now for non-horse people watching this, what is the ICSI? So ICSI is like in vitro fertilization for humans. Okay. So they um, get oocytes from those mares. They 
and long story short, grow them in a petri dish. They um, inject them with sperm, right. and then they either do or don't make embryos. We freeze those embryos generally and put them into mares uh, in February. Okay. So, and the advantage of this technology is what? Why? Why is this growing? Why so is it popular? So, one thing is, is instead of having five great mares, you could realistically have one because we can get a lot more embryos out of them. We okay. have one mare that's going to have twelve babies next year, you okay. know, and she's not carrying one of them. Yeah. So that's a you can have less money in one mare and kind of put all your eggs into one basket if you want. See, that that's a funny thing. See, when I got over here into America in 1997, that was when the whole embryo, the old embryo mm -hmm. transfer thing was getting started. Yeah. And I remember the initial lawsuits that a couple of guys, I don't remember their names, people would know watching, they had a couple of lawsuits with AQHA because mm -hmm. AQHA wouldn't give registered papers yep. to the people doing the embryo transfers. Right. And it turned into a big shit show and a big lawsuit. Yes. And a lot of people said that embryo transfers were going to ruin the quarter horse industry. It was going to make horses so abundant mm -hmm. that the prices were going to plummet. And it was basically the new antichrist and the devil. Yep. Well, look at it. 20 years later, look what's fucking happened. Sure. It's done nothing but grow the industry. We've yep. got so many more good horses out there from embryo transfers. But right. 20 years ago, there was a fair group of people, kind of old fuddy duddies stuck in the mud, mm -hmm. that had been used to breeding one stallion to one mare mm -hmm. the same way forever. Right. And they thought it was going to ruin an industry, and it didn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? It made it grow. So I suspect that's probably what the Ixies industry is going to do. It is. And, you know, you look at... It's a, I'm 50-50 on that. So you look at the thoroughbred industry, those horses bring, it's not uncommon for a yearling to bring a million dollars plus. Yes. We don't have that in the quarter horse industry, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, but I'm going to argue that point. Is it because of that or is it because there's just so much more money to win? Is you it know, or is it not? You, you know, know what I mean? I don't know. There's so much more money to win in the thoroughbred Absolutely. because of the gambling and the jackpot and the slot machines. Yep. That some bitch has got a lot of money in it because of the gambling. Quarter Absolutely. Horse, quarter yeah. horses, maybe the racing part does. Sure. Quarter horse racing, but cutting, reining cow horses, mm -hmm. we don't have that kind of money. Right. Well, let's, so basically you're a one-stop shop from the breeding horses mm -hmm. to the selling of them of all ages primarily quarter horse blood would you say like yes, you're not you're not gonna primarily. you're not doing belgian draft horses no, shit like that it's no. western industry stuff. correct okay so let's how old are you now if you know 29 mind? 29 yep. so at a young age you've really kind of grabbed things by the hair and pulled it around a little bit mm -hmm. and got somewhere quickly mm -hmm. um where'd you grow up so i was born in wichita falls texas okay. um grew up there my parents are um my dad's an engineer. My mom did sonograms, uh, was old sound tech for a living. We lived a great, you know, grew up with a great Middle family. class. Absolutely. And they did everything they could to support my sister and I in anything we wanted to do. So I played a lot of sports. I loved horses, but we couldn't afford to do the horse business, you know, when I was young. But I played a lot of sports and very supportive of everything I wanted to do. And the main reason you didn't have a horse as a kid, you couldn't afford it, didn't have a place to keep it. My parents, like... Were anti-horse? Yeah. They're like... A horse costs two thousand dollars, and then we have to board it every month, <laughs> and then you have to take riding lessons. Yeah. Like that, absolutely not. Like there's yeah. no way we're doing that. And yeah. like they literally, I remember, I was five years, five or six years old. This is one of the only memories I have from when I was that little. And we were at a rodeo. It was Henry at a rodeo, and we drove in, and I saw the rodeo queens on the horses, <laughs> and I was. A, you lost your shit. I was. A, <laughs> I was a terribly bad-minded child. Like, I, I still lose it. When I see those hot women riding around, I still lose my shit, so uh, don't feel bad about it. I was horrible. I would throw, my mom said when I was three and four, they had to call the ambulance all the time because I would get mad and hold my breath till I passed out. Like, I was terrible-minded. So we go to this rodeo, and I see these kids, and I guess I just get on the floor of this van and just throw a complete meltdown fit. Like, That's I funny. want a horse right now. Yeah. And my parents are like, you're never getting one. Like, never. Like, we maybe we'll get you some riding lessons. Mm -hmm. So... I took riding lessons for a couple months, and that was that. It was too expensive. You yes. know, it was just expensive. They are an expensive mm -hmm. animal. You're right. So, so in, in essence, paraphrasing here, you're a little bit of a city girl, so to speak. 100%. Yep. And, and wanted to be a horse girl, and it's, it's just those two worlds are not meshing too well. They don't. So at what point did you get to mesh them? Like in high school, when you got so, your own money? What happened to where you could get a horse in your life? There was the this place called Whispers of Hope Horse Farm. It was a therapeutic riding facility in Wichita Falls. And they took volunteers there, and you had to be 10 years old. So we were sitting in an Applebee's, on, for my birthday, and I saw on the front page of the paper they had this 
uh, story about Whispers of Hope and the volunteers there. And it said at the bottom of the story, like, if you are interested in becoming a volunteer and you're 10 years old or older, this is the number you call. Well, I'm like, Mom, this, we're doing this. And my mom's like, no, we're not. You know, and I'm like, yes, we are. So we make the, we have to go to this meeting, you know, and my mom comes with me and she's like, this is disgusting. The, it <laughs> smells like horses. You know, we have to clean the stalls. And they're like all outside stalls. And they were fine, but they're gross, yeah. you know. And yeah. she's like, this is horrible. Like, you smell terrible. And <laughs> you have to ride in my car and come home like this because it was always muddy out there. So yeah. I'd come home in mud boots covered yeah. in horse shit. It was gross. Yeah. So they hated it, but they tolerated it. And I volunteered out there. So I started out there and just, like, worked my way up. Like, started with stall cleaning is literally what that lady made us do. And I was, like, thrilled to do it. Like, I would have cleaned stalls 24-7 if I could have skipped school and done it. I just loved it. I was ate up with it. So then I got to ride a little bit, and um, then at, long story in there, I worked there hours and hours you and hours. You started at the bottom. 100%. Hold, hold that thought, because okay. I want to say something that popped into my yeah. mind. And Just, I was obsessed with it. Like, that's the that's thing. That's the key word, obsessed and obsessed. a passion. Obsessed. Like, that was, I was completely <laughs> ate up with it. Like, when you say I lived it, slept it, ate, Rip, that's yeah. all I wanted to do. That was it. But you started cleaning the shit. You started at the bottom. A tons of them. Yes. That's all I did. Yeah. No yeah, writing. Yeah. So I want to say this, interject this right here. So just hold where your train of thought okay. is right there. So I did a tour in Jacksonville, Florida a couple of weeks ago. And at the end of the day, I do autographs and photos and stuff. And a guy came up to me and uh, he said, uh, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm 24 years old. I, I didn't grow up with horses, had nothing to do with them, but I'm really intrigued by it. I want to learn everything about horses and the horse industry, blah, blah, blah. He was selling clothes at a men's store in town and in, in some fancy town in Florida. I can't remember where it was. And, and um, he said, well, you know, right now I'm, I'm working at a place and I'm feeding horses and, and, you know, doing the grunt work, that kind of stuff. And he says, you know, how do I get to ride? You know, what do I, what mm -hmm. do I need to do to, to, what do I need to do to do, where do I can get to train horses? And I said, well, you're already doing it. And he said, no, 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 I'm not getting to train any horses. And I said, how long have you been there? He said, about four months. And I said, well, you need to understand something. This is not going to happen overnight. You have no skill set. These horses are thousands upon thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. No horse trainer is going to let you start touching and training a horse worth thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands when you don't know shit from clay. You don't know anything. You're just a warm body. You're a yep. liability more than anything. Absolutely. So, so four months, you should be blessed that they're letting you do the grunt work. Mm -hmm. You've got, you're bringing nothing to the table. Right. Now, once you've stayed there a year and you've cleaned the stalls and you've done all the shitty jobs and you've really worked hard, first to show up, last guy to leave, somebody will notice that. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get to do a little bit of maybe training, a little bit of riding on somebody's old retired horse. Mm -hmm. You stay there another year, you keep doing the grunt work and you keep working hard, you're going to get a better opportunity at the second year. Mm -hmm. And then the third year and then the fourth year. But you're starting from such a beginner place, you're so unrealistic thinking that in four months you should be riding or training somebody's horse. Right. Now I said, you can go buy your own. You know what his answer was? Why well, don't have the money to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, no shit, Sherlock. We mm -hmm. don't have the money. So when you don't have the money, you don't, beggars can't be choosers. Mm -hmm. Start at the bottom. Work your way to the top. And I could tell the longer I kept talking, he didn't like what I had to say. Mm -hmm. It was pissing him off. You, you'd almost say if it was a dream fucking killer for mm -hmm. him. I didn't say quit doing it. I just said be realistic. Mm -hmm. Start at the bottom. Right. But too many people, uh, young people now, have no concept of that whatsoever mm -hmm. about starting at the bottom and working your way to the top. So you were 10 years old shoveling shit at a volunteer therapeutic place, mm -hmm. and now you're 29 years old, mm -hmm. so 19 years later, making a shit ton of money in the horse industry and is the number one horse selling woman in the country. Mm -hmm. In 19 years, but it started with you cleaning stalls for free. And I knew nothing, mind yes. you. Like I- Didn't know the front end from the back end. Nothing. Yes. I had no idea what a good horse was. I had no, no idea. They're just, they're delusional. He was delusional. And I told him, I said, I'm not trying to ruin your dream here. I said, you just need to be realistic. You're upset because after four months, you're not riding somebody's horse and training it. Right. You know, you have nothing to offer us. Right. 
Start at the bottom. And I don't know whether he would or wouldn't, but my, my key to that is, is that you said two things that struck a nerve with me, is passion. Mm -hmm. You went to bed thinking about it. You woke up thinking about it. You thought about it during the day. And the next thing is you were happy mm -hmm. to start at the bottom. Yeah. I had a kid one time come through my ranch that was a horrible rider, very limited experience, but wanted to be in the academy and so forth. And he was horrible. And, and it, but a really good worker, great attitude, et cetera, et cetera. It, and this is rare for me. I didn't have the heart to fire. Mm -hmm. Normally, I'm a heartless prick, and I'll fire anyway. <laughs> I've fired my mother on Christmas Day before, okay? So I didn't even have the heart mm -hmm. to fire, hire this son, fire this son bitch because he's just such a hard worker, good guy, great attitude. Mm -hmm. So I said, fuck it. I'll take the easy way out, and I'll just run the son bitch off. Mm -hmm. I'll just work him to death, run him off, give him every shitty job. So I gave him a job. I had built this new fence, and uh, he had to get a grinder, and he's scraping off the... the uh, the rust because yep. I had to paint it. So he's grinding all the rust off this fence. And one of my, the fence builder that built the fence, he was over there checking the fence. And, and this is 110 degrees. And um, this guy's name was Mitch. And he's got a mask on and face and it's hot as hell. Miserable job mm -hmm. too, mind you. I was convinced that was going to run him off. Right. Convinced of it. Okay. And uh, my welder buddy said to him, so how do you like being here? And you know what that guy did? He pulled down his mask and he looked at that fence builder and he said, I'm just happy to be here. Mm. Isn't that yeah, rare? That is rare. I'm just happy to be Very, here. very rare. So guess what? When I proved, when he proved to me I couldn't run the son bitch off, mm -hmm. I let him start training horses. Yep. A year and a half later, he got to be a pretty damn good hand. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually he got some pussy and left. Okay, so that'll, <laughs> get, that'll get a man at any point, okay? That's the most secret weapon in yeah. the world, okay? So in his defense, he left after that. But yeah. before that got a hold of him, he got to where he was worthless to me mm -hmm. and within about a two and a half year period got to be pretty damn handy, could start some colts and get around a problem horse, etc. Mm -hmm. But he had to prove to me he wanted it bad than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I tried to run him off, I couldn't do it. But that always stuck with me because that welder came back and told me that story and he said, Clinton, whatever you do, you can't get rid of this guy. He said, yeah. he genuinely looked at me and he said, I'm just happy to be here. Absolutely. I bet you were happy just to clean stores. Thrilled. Like I would have done, like I said, I would have quit school and gone and done it every day. Yes. Parents would have let me. Yes. I was thrilled. Yes. So. And that's, that is what I think people that see the success you've had and I've had and mm -hmm. other people in the horse industry have had and they want to start at that success level and Absolutely. they're just completely delusional about where you have to start mm -hmm. and the struggles to get to number one. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're there, you're cleaning stalls. How do you progress from there? What happens? So we, um, I eventually get to start riding a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a natural, yes. like I, I'm fine. Yeah. I can get on the horse. I'm athletic enough. I don't generally fall off. Yes. Okay. I have no idea what's going on. So I'm just, once again, I'm happy to be there. Right. Um, and good place to do it because they're quiet horses. Generally, yes, they were great. Yeah. And so then that lady had a, like, I am forever in debt to that lady yeah. because she loved doing the therapeutic riding, but also she was passionate about letting people from the city come and learn to ride, you awesome. know? And like, had she have never been there, I, I, who knows if I would be doing this, yes. you know? And so she gave us opportunities to do what was called sponsoring a horse. So I had an old horse that was like 22, her name was Cinnamon or something, I think. Cinnamon is what her name was. Mm -hmm. So we got to sponsor her, it was like $80 a month. And then she got to be my horse to ride, That's right? Awesome. And so um, I had started riding her, you know, worked out there all the time. So, so after school, things like that. Every waking. How minute. did you get there? Rode a bike. How your well, parents dropped you off. Well, my sister is still salty at me because <laughs> she was six years older than me. So that was right when she got her driver's license. So she stuck with your ass. The reason she got a car and was able to drive it was to drive me around. That's so awesome. um, I have to hear about that all the time because I smelled really bad. You yeah, know, they yeah. hated it. Like yeah. they thought it was disgusting. Yeah. So everybody so. in the family is against you. Hundred percent. I mean, my parents are like, I think it's great you're doing this, but you're gross, and yeah. this whole thing is gross. You know? <laughs> Sleep outside with dogs. Absolutely, literally, <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so I start riding, go there. They kind of get a decent idea of horsemanship. Okay, um, I'll never forget it. At fifteen, I finally convinced my dad to buy me a horse. Okay, okay. I get a thousand dollars. I think twelve hundred dollars. That's Are my budget. Are you making any money of your own? Not at this yet. Point? Not okay. yet. Right. But I, I've got a whole plan for him. Like I've get. Well, I work around the neighborhood a little yeah, bit. But I've jobs. presented this idea to my dad. Like, Dad, I have this little moped scooter that I can take the back way in our neighborhood to get to this little farm. 
to be able to take care of my horse. So that way y'all don't have to take me because I Love hated it. listening to him gripe. Oh, we have to take you to feed these damn horses today. You know, you they found hate. a way is what you Yes, did. so I got my little moped scooter. It was like $500. We bought it and I could drive myself to the barn. I had to wear my helmet. That was completely illegal, but it was fine. Okay, so, <laughs> but it. my dad was, he always wanted me to ride dirt bikes. Yeah. That's what his, like, passion was. So this was his way of getting me on something that had wheels he and thought, not hooks. He thought you were going to give up the yeah, horse Yeah, no. And so, um, so I presented this idea to him. Like, I have my moped, and I can go and clean stalls there and give riding lessons. Because I ride good enough to let, to help yeah. little kids yeah. ride now. Yeah. And she was real good about teaching us like how the right way to saddle and brush and pick up their feet and all that stuff. So I could teach a little kid to do that now. And so we go and start looking at horses. Well, we go to a horse trader's place, okay? And I don't, we're like, just have a huge, like, we're, they're just looking to screw us. Like yeah, you they got a know. sign on it that says we don't know anything. We know nothing. We like show up in a van. My dad has a yellow Dodge truck, bright yellow with a little one horse trailer. Like we just, I mean, they know. Do it out. So we pull up and they're like, we have a barrel horse and I want to barrel race them. And this is how I try the horse. It's a Tennessee Walker crossed with a quarter horse, which oh I didn't my. know then, right? Yeah. I just think it's beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> and so... They're like, yeah, you can try it. I literally remember we're in a wheat field and the way I tried it was I just let it run off in the wheat field. And I was like, dad, this horse is so fast. <laughs> this is the one, okay? So I get it home and then I'm like, and the lady of course is like, yeah, you guys can um, buy it. And then if you have any problems, we'll take it back. Like we have like a one week guarantee. Well, I get it home and then I figure out like this thing is half gated, you know, once I'm not running it around the wheat field and it's a terrible horse. like. You pull on it, it, it throws its head up and runs off. Like, it, there's no training here, okay? Right. It doesn't buck. That's the only thing it doesn't do. But it does rear up, run off, all the other things. Okay, ticked all the other boxes. All the other boxes are ticked. Okay, so <laughs> we want to take it back, and the lady's like, um, yeah, uh, uh, and then hangs up the phone, we never hear from her again. <laughs> like, no, you call, you don't get anybody. Okay, so I have this horse. So you're, you're going to be a little mad about this. But then I'm it. like, okay. Well, I'm just going to fix this horse uh -huh. because I don't have a choice, right? You I don't, don't know have how a to sell it. You I don't have, have any money. I have a round pin, an arena, and I've got to feed horses and clean stalls to pay for this thing. I have like yeah. basically $300 a month I have to make plus enough to put gas in my moped scooter. So I got to make about $350 a month to survive. <laughs> so I've got a plan. So I make a little extra money. I start trading hay is what I do. So like, I'm like, dad, see, if you drive the truck, I'll put the hay on the trailer. Okay. And we can mark the hay up $3 a bale for getting it out of the field because it's already cheaper because they're usually not getting it out of the field. Cause these are all city people. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, we can mark it up like three to $5 a bale. Then my hay's paid for it's for free. And all I need you to do is drive the truck. Like I'll load the hay on there. So we go pick up hay and do all that. See, that, that just goes again. You, you saw a need for something. Yes. Something as simple as that. Yes. They needed hay, and none of those city people wanted to go haul yes. it. Yes. You know, and I was happy to get it and go stack it in people, their feed room. People ask, how do you start a business? How do you make money? Here's how you do it. Look around you. Look, mm -hmm. what can you do better than everybody else? Ac that's Where exactly. Where is there a need? Yes. Where is there a need that nobody's filling? Right. You don't have to be passionate about it. I actually don't believe that old saying that, you know, if you if you love what you do, the money will come. Yeah. I actually don't believe that. Yeah, I Sometimes agree. it will happen. Yes. It's a great romantic jerk me off saying, mm -hmm. but as a general rule, most of us are not lucky enough to love what we do and make a lot of money. I'm yeah. not saying that you can't be done, and I'm not even saying you don't do it, yeah. but as a general rule, most of us are not that lucky. Yes. You know, a guy that I really respect a lot is, a, a lot is that um, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs. Mm -hmm. And Mike says, I listen to all these interviews, and he's this phenomenal guy about life and money and, and work ethic. And he says, most of the people that own those businesses that we did the TV show, Dirty Jobs, he said, they're multi-millionaires. They're loaded in money. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know why? They realized there was a, there was a niche for something. Mm -hmm. Something was not being done. Yes. Something that somebody else didn't want to do, these people stepped up and said, I'll do it. It right. ain't a fun job. It's a shitty job. It's a dirty job, but I'll do it. Yes. You think they were passionate about pump and septic? Mm -hmm. No. But they recognized there was money there. Mm -hmm. They recognized that they could do a service better than everybody else. So something just as simple as you recognizing that city people didn't want to pick up their own hay, mm -hmm. 
and you could go get it for $3, pick it up mm -hmm. and sell it for 6 Yes. and started brokering a deal. But the need was nobody else was doing it. Yep. So people sometimes get bogged down on how do I start a business or I'm not, you know, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't think you have to be that passionate. Mm -hmm. You have to recognize what can you do or what service is not being presented or, de or, or effectively um, handled correctly that you think you can do it better. And sometimes I think it's not about that your job is passionate. Like I'm not passionate about trading hay, but I was passionate about what trading hay was funding. Yes, it was you know? your money, yes. So the whole reason I'm hustling hay is because I want to buy Pat Pirelli's level you one sick program. Bitch. This I'm is sorry. Over. <laughs> this, this interview is over. I knew you were gonna Pack this that. shit up and get out of here. Tree so hugger. I buy that and I buy the whole, and it was expensive. Expensive, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, a thousand dollars or something. It was a lot. But I trade hay and I don't remember what else I did. You know, lunge somebody's horse every day. I don't know, whatever. So you bought Pirelli's kit and what the hell happened? Well, I mean, it helped because I had, but I mean, I had only up to go on my horse. Yes. Like, he, like there was <laughs> a good no more going down. He already ran off, ran through the bridle. Mm. I'm sure he was half crippled. I didn't know then, but yeah. you know, and so I buy that and I get the carrot stick or what, isn't that what it was called? Yeah. And I have the fancy halter and like the three lead ropes that are all different sizes. Oh yeah, you took it. You drank the Kool-Aid bag. Thing. I was obsessed. Oh, okay. I love it. So I get my little laptop that we I'm get. I'm gonna from give school. you shit about this for the rest of I your know, life. I know. I never told I, you I, this. You should but never I have told me I'm this because now that I know where your goat is, I'm gonna let that son of a bitch out. <laughs> and so <laughs> I l remember I had my little hay bale set up in the feed room at the boarding facility, and I had a plug there so I could plug in my computer, and I just lived at the watching these videos and I would watch the video and I would go outside and this horse he didn't have a choice because <coughs> I jacked with him all the time he just gave up he suicide. just gave it up I, like I mean you know it. I I don't remember all the steps but I mean like I said there was only up to go but I remember one part of his video was like if your horse wants to run off just let him run off he'll quit running off eventually so I just get on the saddle put a halter and a lead rope on this horse you know you like you're natural. supposed to flip it over their head and <laughs> pull him around in one rein stop him so I do that and this horse runs off and I just let him run off and these people are like watching they're like you're gonna get hurt yeah. you know and I'm like well I don't know what else to do I mean I can ride good enough he's just running really fast around this round pit but I mean we look like a racehorse isn't it funny when, when when you get older and you're more experienced and you look back at the shit you did with horses <sighs> as kids, you honestly wonder how you did live through it. Like Literally. You really do it wonder. It was dangerous. Yes. It was dangerous. And I remember as a kid, my horse wouldn't stand still to get on. <laughs> so what I did is I tied him to the fence, but it was a barbed wire <laughs> fence, and I'd snap the lead oh rope up to the snaffle bit and tied him up to a barbed wire fence, I would get on the horse with a bucket, then I'd crawl down the horse's neck, unsnap the snaffle bit from the barbed wire fence and ride off. But like the thing is, is, you couldn't have killed that hore. I'm sure he was very but tolerant. But I think horses, but when I think at horses at some point, they just realize you're dumb as dog shit. They just, <laughs> this one's not worth killing. Yeah, absolutely. And they just keep you alive. So, yeah. So you get, did you get the horse better or not? I did. Awesome. Okay, I got him better. And then eventually I started running barrels on him. And he was actually okay. Like once yeah. I got him retrained, I mean for me, yes. then it yeah. Was, yeah. we made a barrel pattern. We did not, like it was great That's to okay. me. okay. Okay. Went from a straight line running off to now three turns. So that was wonderful. So then I'm like, okay, well, I think I have him gentle enough. I can start giving lessons on him. So then I start this little lesson business and it's like huge. Like now tell me again, why'd you do that? Did you see a need for it? You because there was money there? so the air force base was right there, like maybe 15 minutes from where I board my horses. And a lot of them boarded their horses there. And this base was where, um, pilots came from all over the world so like there was a lot of people from germany that came and um i can't remember whatever like austria mm -hmm. and i don't know a bunch of different places and so they all came and most of them could speak english and everything and of course when they came to texas they wanted to ride horses so i it was like i thought well i can make a website and when you search on google and you put Wichita Falls, Texas horse riding lessons in, right now, like three of the places that come up don't even give lessons anymore. Awesome. So I'm like 16 and so I'm you like- see, you see a need for it. That's yes. what I'm saying. Yes. You saw a need for something. Yes. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not like you had a passion for giving lessons, correct? You I hated to make it, money. honestly. I hated That's okay. It. I had a couple I don't think, girls I don't think that were really to buy. there's anything fucking wrong, Melanie, with people saying they do something for the money. Yes. I, I wish more people would have the balls to say it. Yeah. I did my whole career for money. Yeah. 
Uh, but I'm not. But ju but just you like helped a lot of people. I, still. I know I helped a lot of people. Yeah. But again, it's no shame into saying you do something for money. Mm -hmm. There's like there's people think there's a dirty word that you can actually admit. If the truth be known, 80 percent of people that go to their day jobs, mm -hmm. if it's in a factory or it's working at Walmart, don't necessarily like it. They do it because it pays well. Sure. But yep. I don't see the shame in saying that. That's right. why I think that whole saying that, you know, you, you have to do what you love to do. I don't think most of us are lucky enough to do it. Right. Because if it was, everybody would be doing a job they love to do. Mm -hmm. It'd be that easy. Right. But, but what I'm getting at again is from the hay to the lessons, there was a need for something. Mm -hmm. You saw it wasn't being done and you filled that need. Absolutely. I get that question all the time. How do I start a business? What kind of business to start, Clinton? We're talking about it right that's now. That's a great, I get We're that question all the time too. We're talking about it now. Yep. Find something that somebody's not meeting that need and mm -hmm. do it. Yes. Or find a service that people suck at and make a better service. And even if you, like you said, even if you don't love it, that can be a bridge to maybe something yes. you do love, right? So, Absolutely. Um, because I love selling horses in general. Yes. In general. Yes, in general. But um, but I couldn't have just started selling horses at 16. No. They'd have laughed at me. Yes. I had no business doing it. So you do this lesson for how long? He's lesson. So I do lessons horse? for quite a while. On the one horse? Well, I buy more horses oh, because I start do. making some money, You're right? You're picking this son of a bitch so out. Like, some more. I, I, I can buy. So I like. What are your parents thinking about this? When you're starting to make some money now and you're 16, I, have they turned the corner yet? Do they, because a lot of a lot of parents think when their kids get to 15, 16, they're going to get into boys. Horses yeah. are out the door. Yeah. You know, this is just a dream. Yep. They're never going to stick with it. Are they are they starting to realize you're not right in the head now? Yeah. Are they, they starting get to that. realize you really want this? Yes, they get that. And they're as supportive as they can be. Like yes. they buy me a truck. And my dad has my little trailer, and like my dad, the whole year I'm 15 makes me learn how to back. The biggest thing was I had to learn to back the trailer before I could go forward, That's right? Awesome. So he makes me learn to back the trailer. We go, and I drive that horse trailer everywhere, and he's just chomping at the bit for the day I'm 16, and he doesn't have to drive me around yeah. anymore. Like, yeah. that's like was the day of freedom for him. If you ask him, <laughs> he's like, I finally got to watch the Cowboys again, and I finally got freedom. That's so, awesome. um, Anyway, so I he gets me the truck, and I'm working at a restaurant, but I'm also, like, my little lesson business is starting to pick up speed. Mm -hmm. And at this point, too, I have found some people around there that have rope horses and barrel horses that kind of take me under their wing, and I get to go up there. And that's the first time I've learned, like, what is a lead? I didn't, I'm didn't. i giving these lessons to kids that are walking and trotting. Yeah. And I've kind of learned leads and all that with my little Pirelli deal, but yeah. I don't know much. Yeah. Well, I spend a summer with them. Well, it's life changing. Yes. Like I learn a little horsemanship and then I see like, wow, the horses, I have terrible horses. Yes. These are like good horses and they weren't great horses, but they were decent horses, yeah. you know? So the first horse you rode, you thought was the greatest horse in the world because it was better than riding your bike. Absolutely. It reminds and me a lot of the first time I had sex. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was yes. better than what I was doing. Absolutely. But looking back on it, it was pretty <laughs> shitty. It was okay. terrible. <laughs> God bless that girl for putting up with me. But anyway, yes. but but yeah, we don't know how shitty our horses are because we don't know what we don't know. I don't know, know the difference. But I'm looking back on it, it's like, man, it was a nag. Terrible. But to us at that age, it was the most beautiful nag in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm working at a restaurant. I'm doing my lessons. My parents, to kind of go back to your question, are like, look, everybody that we know that's in the horse business is broke and crippled. Like smart, A smart observation. They're like, they're... 45 years old and living in a trailer house, but pulling a $300,000 rig, yeah. they can barely pay their bills yeah. and they're all crippled. Yeah. You cannot be in the horse business. Like they're like, you can't do it. We will not allow it. So I, and I was decent in school. Like I was, I made good grades, you yeah. know, it was, it was fine. And so I didn't put a lot of effort into it. Was academics it, easy for you? It was easy. Natural. I could just coast through it. See, and, I, I hated women like you. Yeah. Cause I could never do it. I was I, an A-B student, don't yeah, get me wrong, yeah, but, but I put no effort into it. I was a D-E. Yeah. Okay, so. We help people like you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I paid bitches like you all. Yes, That's and exactly I was happy to I take did. your money. <laughs> I gave you money to help me yeah, pass, and, and I'm I, glad I did it. I was happy to take your money, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> so, um, I decide that I'm going to stay close, and after I graduate high school, I go to nursing school. Or I get a bachelor's degree, but go to nursing school. So you're about 19 now, 18? I'm 19 years old. I've started working for Crumpler Brothers, who's, who are cutters. They were like 
my true entry into the cutting and performance horse industry, performance horse industry. cow horse cutting kind of industry. They were wonderful to me. It was a very good relationship with both of us. Like I was very helpful to them and they were very helpful to me. That's awesome. You know, I could come and work out there and ride their horses for free in exchange for my horse being there and getting to give lessons there. That's awesome. So it was a great relationship and they're great people. They're, Where are they out of? They're in Wichita Falls. Okay. Um, they, so kind of to circle about, they had me as Wood and Woody Be Tough. And okay. so I was out there when Woody just left, wrote a bunch of Woody Be Tough babies. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we'll go back to that. But went to nursing school. The lesson deal was huge. Like I kept upping my prices and they just kept coming. Like Love it. it was like, I was at like $40 an hour and then I was at $50 an hour. And then I, by, by the time I was done, I was charging $75 an hour, so, which was a lot of money 10 yes, years ago in of college. Of course it was. Of course yeah. it was. I want to ask you this question for, from, I have my answer to it, but I want to hear yours. What made you know that it was time to raise your price? When, when you were $40 lesson, what made you say I better go to 50? Well, I was in school, so I only had so much time. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, like, I, I say I didn't like giving lessons. I had some girls that I loved. Yes. The girls that were good kids, that was, and Try they hard. were, and they were ate up with it. It was a blast. But then that was only about 20% of them. The other 80% were only there because our parents made them. The, the problem with the horse industry is that, unfortunately, the, the, the small percentage of people that torture you mm -hmm. and, and make you so miserable doing what you do they make you not remember the 80% that are good. You get what I'm saying? Even the, the, today. Even today, yes. Yes, I the, get The ones one... that burn a hole in your ass so <sighs> bad because they're such big bitches and they just make your life so miserable, they ruin it for the other 80% that are pretty nice people and, and nice to be around and so forth. But Now we can fire them. I yes, know you now, do the yes, same thing. In the beginning, you can't. You can't no, do it. Now, you put up with them. if you're like that, you need to get out. But let's get back to money. So I want to know what were the key factors because, you know, the Gage podcast that I did, I can't tell you how many horse trainers have walked up to me in the last year and a half since those podcasts mm -hmm. and thanked me, shook my hand. I don't know these people. Right. They've shook my hand. They thanked me and said, I've raised my price. Not one person dropped out. Yes. You told me that, Clinton. Mm -hmm. I raised my price. They, I've made them a lot of money by giving them the confidence to charge more money, charge what they're worth, okay? Yes. I wanna, and because people always ask me, what are key indicators that you know that it's time to go up? Yep. I've got my view on it, but okay. I wanna know your view. At that younger age, because yep. this is instinctive to you, I sure. can tell you, you've got a business mind about you. Yes. You're a hustler, you yep. love making money. Yes. I love making money. Yes. I'm not ashamed to say that. People mm -hmm. think it's a sin to want to make Especially money. Especially in the horse industry. Yes, it, you know, it, it's like a pride of honor to die broke in a single wide trailer. Yes. I love making money. I yes. got off on making money. That's yeah. what excited me was the deal and right. making money. Right. And I was never ashamed to say that I do this for the money. It wasn't poetic, but I loved it. Right. It's funny, in any other industry, if you say you love making money, they think you're a fucking hero. Absolutely. In the horse industry, you say you love making money, they think you're a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. But at that young age, what were the key indicators that told you it was time to go to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 75? You know what I mean? So my time's limited because I'm in school, right? Love it. Okay, I am also limited in time because I, I have some homeschooled kids, but most of these kids are in school every day. So I can only get them from three to six there, or seven. So it's a bottleneck, right? Okay, there. and then I can't go too late because it's bedtime or in the winter it's too cold. Okay, so I've got limited time slots. I can do it. I can do it all day Saturday and Sunday if, if I have time. So I obviously am just like, I'm full. I, and we still, I still do this now. I want to always reward the people that started with mm -hmm. me. So I always had it where I said, you, if you've been here and I like your kid and they're not yeah. a pain in the ass. That's a key word, like your kid. Yeah, then you don't have to pay any, I, you don't, I'm not going up on you. Yeah. Okay, but from now on, any new people, you might still be at $40, they're at 75. Yeah. So then, the, so basically I knew I had a limited amount of time and I had a waiting list. Like I could have gave, I could have quit school and made a good living the rest of my life giving writing lessons if I wanted to. So I just kept going up and I kept kind of weeding out the people I didn't like, you know, hey. And that's what will happen. Yeah. Is, is, is when you go up, some people will leave, not Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely, but a lot, some. But some, but the ones that leave go to the next guy that's cheaper. Yeah. There'll always be a level down. Yep. For sure. There will always be a level down that mm -hmm. somebody will go off to. These people will not leave. The, yep. They will just go to the next guy on the corner that's cheaper than you. And like I had, 
Um, I loved marketing then, and mm. so I had a really good website, and I had the thing Who that- Who built you this some bitch website? I just did it. At 19. Wix, you can get on Wix, and I just would literally spend hours and hours on it until I just figured it out. Like See, I, just, I hate people like you. I can't even set my mind. <laughs> okay. so, so I, one thing that I learned from that experience is one day I sat down and wrote a story about, like I started whenever I was 10, you know, and told kind of my story. My parents weren't horse people. And then I said, you know, I worked to get my first horse. And I told everything we've talked about, I had it in like a, you know, four paragraph story. Yeah. Parents loved that because they wanted their kids to be around somebody that in their eyes, that I was very successful then. That yes. was everything they wanted their kids to be. They wanted them to go Good to school, model. have a passion, be, you know, a responsible adult. They loved it. So like that story there's no telling how much that little story on there made. And the other thing I would put on there is like, you know, when I bought my first horse, we really got screwed, you yeah, know, whatever. Relatable. And and I understand what it takes for an unexperienced parent to buy a horse for their kid. Mm -hmm. And that story was on there and I could have sold kid horses as See, many as I could get. When you really analyze what the story was, you were being very genuine and authentic. Yes. And I've always said, Human beings are attracted to genuine and authentic people. Mm -hmm. That's my famous line about me. You either love me or hate me, yep. but I'm genuine and authentic. Yes. I am and what I am. And honest with them. This is I what it is. I am what I am. Yes. And I'm going to be honest with you. You yep. may not like it. You may hate me and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But what you just really said then is the story you told was not a marketing story. Mm -hmm. It was genuine and authentic. Mm -hmm. When you're genuine and authentic, you'll be amazed how many people are drawn to that. If yes. you just have the confidence to be who you are. Right, right. And I, so I used that story and had a really nice website. And so, like I said, I continue to go up on the prices. And the other thing I learned was, okay, well, if I buy more horses, I can do these group lessons. And mm. I can still charge, like, probably $50 a kid, and then I make $200 an hour, Love right? It. So then I'm like, I need to maximize my time. That's what I was learning. That was the lessons looking back now that yes. I was learning was I have a limited amount of time, yes. and I have to maximize so it. So going back to Gordon McKinley, there's mm -hmm. not enough hours in the day mm -hmm. and with your own two hands to get rich. Yes. He told me that when I was 13 years old. There's not enough hours in the day and with your own two hands to get rich. Mm -hmm. That's why I wasn't a horse trainer. Mm -hmm. Even though I wanted to be a horse trainer, I love training horses, mm -hmm. but I knew I couldn't make that much money doing that shit. Yeah. That's why I got into selling VHS tapes and right. doing clinics and things because I could I could do 10 hours but reach so many more people. Yes. So again, you're, you, you, you're, you're very limited. Time. It comes back to that. Unless you're a gold maker, a, a painter, you're doing something so rare nobody can duplicate. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to financially get rich off your own two hands of actually doing it. Yes, absolutely. And I, I didn't know maybe I was figuring that out then, but mm -hmm. I was. Yeah. You know, so. So I want to stop you there for just a second about prices and so forth, okay? So I've got some, uh, I've got, you know, the Clinton Anderson Academy. Mm -hmm. We have people come in, 10 students and two times a year. So 20 students come in and do the academy. And if they graduate, they get to use my method and name and all that and train horses. Well, recently I've had some students that have said to me, yeah, I'm booked up for a year. I've got enough training business for a year. Mm -hmm. And I, and they kind of acted proud of it. And I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. That's disgusting. And they looked at me and said, why? And I said, if you're booked up for a year, you're not charging enough. Yes. That, that is an absolute shame. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you charging right now? They said $4,500 for six weeks to train somebody's horse. And you're booked for a year? Terrible. Raise it to six, minimum, yeah. maybe seven. You don't want to be booked more than six months in advance at the most. Mm -hmm. Ideally, three. Yep. Three is about where you want to be. I tell my students, if you're booked any more than three, you're on the verge of being too cheap. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you know who taught me that? Or, or really verbalized and taught me that? was Doug. Yeah. Doug yeah. was really, he really pushed that on me, was like, just like that. You need to go up. You need to go up. If they're willing to pay it and you got a waiting list, That's you've exactly got to go right. up. That's exactly right. I don't want my people to be the cheapest. I want them to be the best. Yes. They're not having to train 15 horses to make a living. They just need two, paying them six, 7,000 each. Yes. They get two horses, work them two and a half hours a day, six days a week, and make, can make 12 grand in six weeks. That's a great. Not damn bad money. It's pretty good money. Uh, and, and they always say, well, the local guy down the road charges 1,000. We don't give a shit. We're not competing with him. Yes. He's not our competition. Yep. We're, he's riding the horse three days a week for 30 minutes and usually got a high school kid doing it. Yep. You know what I mean? We don't want to be cheap. 
But you can be really expensive, but if you charge six grand, you sure shit better give them eight grand of value. Yes, absolutely. It always comes back to that. I don't care what you charge, you better make sure that customer walks away feeling like they got more than they paid for. Mm -hmm. If they always feel like they got more than they paid for, they'll leave with a smile on their face. Yes. You know, I remember uh, Loomis told me one time about breeding horses and he said, you know, sometimes horses just don't get in fold. Doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you do, how you breed them, best vets in the world, best technology in the world, it just won't get knocked up. Simple mm -hmm. as that. And he said, when the mares that did that, he said, I always made sure they went home as fat as fools, mm -hmm. slick and fat and sassy and clipped up. Because he said when the owners would come to pick up the mare, they're already a bit pissed off. Mm -hmm. They've had it there for four months. It hasn't got pregnant. They're disappointed. Their dream's been shattered. Mm -hmm. He said if a, horse, if a horse walks out of the stall, clipped, bathed, braided, shiny and fat, they're not blaming me. Mm -hmm. They just know it's bad luck. Yes. But if the mare's a little ribby or she's a little hairy or a, a mane's got a big old knot in it, mm -hmm. even though she's a brood mare, it's got a big old knot in it, Oh, well, she didn't get in fall because they don't care about her. Yes. You know, they didn't even feed her. So if they didn't even feed her right, how the hell would they breed her right? Mm -hmm. And he, he told me that trick 20 years it's, ago. It's and it's just good on. business. Yes. It's just good business. Yes. They were already upset. They, they're looking for somebody to blame. Make sure that it's not you. Yes. But again, it, I don't care if you charge $10,000 a month. As long as they feel like they got $11,000 worth of value, mm -hmm. you'll always be okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So keep going. So you're giving lessons. You start buying some more horses. So you're a bit of a pimp now. You're pimping these Then I hire some out. girls, right? Then oh, I, you really are I a pimp. Hire you're my pimping friends. these kids out. So I've got my friends, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, do you want to come make 20 bucks an hour, which is really good money then? And I'm like, all you do is show up and tell these kids what to do. I love it. Okay. So we're like, if you can't abuse kids, who can you abuse? We I love have it. a whole <laughs> business. Like it's great. So then the other thing I add to it is I start buying ponies. So I ride with my kids every time because I felt like I could do a better job. Now, I'm a little confused. Are you still in nursing school? At I'm this still point? in nursing school. So when, what hours do you do in nursing school? Well, nursing school is a little like the other school. Like the first three years of it, I just kind of, we just survived. Like okay. I went to class every once in a while, took the test. I'm sure shit glad you don't mind Be your C student, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I had to really crack down the last semester because I almost failed. But, okay. but I did, I spent the last semester of nursing so school. So you're spending most of your time at the barn is what yeah, you're telling me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Until the last semester of nursing school, I'm at the barn. Okay. And so um, I start buying these ponies and I ride the ponies first and get them over whatever they've got going on. Mm -hmm. And then I, so I get to sit on them like six hours on Saturday and Sunday each day or maybe 10. Like mm -hmm. we gave as many lessons as I could fit in. So, you know, it. they just give it up. You know how it is. Like those ponies are like, <laughs> we hate this. So then I make the kids ride them for like six or eight hours, right? So then I put my more advanced girls on them and we jump over. So they're stuff just and looking to commit suicide. These ponies are just wandering around. We'll be broke. For, they're like, we'll be broke. We give up. <laughs> we'll do whatever we We're want. We're waving the white flag. <laughs> we'll be in front of a train. I'll do it. Yes. And so <laughs> then I start selling these ponies. Well, I. Okay. So let me ask you about the pony thing. Yeah. Again, getting back to money and business. Uh -huh. Did you see a need for ponies? Did, were people trying to buy them? Why yes. ponies? So, tell, tell me how because that Because I could happened. buy them for like $300 off Craigslist. Okay. okay. But did, did you know there was a need to resell them or not Well, really? I knew that there would be. Okay. I mean, I know there's always people looking for ponies, right? Yes, they and, are. and so I'm like, and Craigslist is how I traded horses then. So I'd buy them I went to Craigslist. Craigslist for other things, but yeah. anyway, keep Yeah, going. okay, yeah. so Craigslist is what I use. I it's buy very them for, resourceful. Yes, I buy them for $300. I use them for six months, maybe tops, three to six months. Abuse them for three to six months. Yep. Then I make my cool YouTube videos of like, my kids are writing them in the YouTube videos, right? Because I got them ready for whoever. So I, I take it. videos and these kids love it. Like Kids are having a ball. They think it's amazing. So it's They're like a win. They're the superstar. Yes. And so then I like sell some of these ponies I've gave $200 for and used for lessons for like six grand. I'm like... <laughs> This is I like, it. I think I'm the richest person in America. Like You probably were at that time. I was. I was like, like, like looking back on it, what, you 19 or 20 by now? 21? Yeah, and so I'm 21 probably. Okay, all jokes aside, you're making 50 grand a year, 100 grand a year. What yeah, are you and making? then, yeah, probably 50 grand a year. And That's then, so bad. And then I get these cutting rejects and I'm buying them and I'm starting them on the barrels. Well, I crack a couple of those off. I crack one off for 60,000 and one for 28,000. I can, <laughs> And I'm like... This is amazing. 
<laughs> you know, like. Why I, isn't everybody doing oh, this? Oh, I'm like, this is so easy. Like, mm -hmm. this is just crazy. So then it's like the person that takes their first hit of drugs yes. and you're like hooked. Yeah. You're just like, I yeah. don't even, why would I want to go work for $20 an hour somewhere? Yes. You I know, I like, I mean, when you add up all the hours, what do you make in an hour? I don't know. Cause I spent an a and ridiculous that's, that, that's, amount of time okay, And let's talk about that for a second because we're painting a pretty cool picture here. Yeah. You're making money, yeah. you're having fun, mm -hmm. you're pimping kids and horses out, yeah. things are making <laughs> some money, okay? But let's be honest, there's a lot of fucking hours going into this. A lot. And let's, let, because that's the part that kids don't see. Yes. You know, I, I did a tour in Montana this year and I had about six girls walk up to me and I got to sign this paper for them and, and they say, can you write something inspirational on this for me? And they must have been part of some fucking 4-H club or something. Yeah. So I, I write on there, uh, work harder, yes. don't stop. When I handed it back to them, you thought I would have told them Santa's a piece of shit. <laughs> like, they were so disappointed. Yeah. But I, my inspirational quote was, work harder and don't stop. Yeah. They wanted me to write something, look at the sky and the clouds will take you to your next dream and fucking husband. Everybody. And knows. I wrote, work hard and don't stop. Yes. It's almost like I kicked them in the ass. They mm -hmm. hated it. Yes. But that's the one ingredient these little bitches needed. It they is. They needed that. Yes. Work harder and don't stop. Yep. I wasn't the best clinician, far from it, mm -hmm. but I sure as shit beat the rest because I outworked them. Yes. I took what was my lack of talent mm -hmm. and lack of ability and turned a negative into a positive, which is, I can't beat them on talent. Right. I can't beat them on ability, but I'll sure as shit work them into the ground. Yes. I turned a negative into a fucking positive. Yep. So that's something that that I want you to hit on right now is you were doing the seven days a week, correct? Eight. If there eight. was eight, I was doing yes. it. Yes. You're up early. You're, you're doing, you know, Kim, tell me some of the hours you were doing back oh, then. Oh, I mean, we would, because in the summer I would start early because I had to go ride my barrel horses that I was training, yeah. right? Because I thought I wanted to be a horse trainer. Yeah. Terrible horse trainer. But yes. I made it through training barrel horses. Yes. So, you know, I'd start at five in the morning and I'd have to go lope for the cutters too. So sometimes we had to start at four. Yeah. So we're starting at four or five. I lope for them. I work my barrel horses and then I start lessons maybe on a Saturday or whatever. Or I have to go to class, you know? And then sometimes I do have to study a little bit to survive nursing school. Yeah. Um, and then, you know. It's your life, though. This ain't a nine to five gig. Uh, it, it's, I'm it's obsessed. It's consuming you. But yes. I, am en I enjoy it because I'm finding some success in it, but it doesn't matter. I'm still working 24 seven. Yes. But here's another key thing. This is why I tell people the decade, and you're in this decade now. The decade from 20 to 30 is the decade to get your shit together. Yes. It's the decade to build your career. Yes. It's the decade to work hard mm -hmm. because it's a special decade. You're the energizer bunny. Mm -hmm. You're giving me energy just listening to you talk about it because yeah. it, it's, it's the one decade that you're the stupidest because you don't know anything, yeah. but you have the most amount of fucking Mountain Dew in your blood. Absolutely. That you'll just do whatever it takes to be successful if you're passionate. And it's the easiest, energy is the easiest thing for you to get back. Mm -hmm. And then as you get older, you realize, shit, that was a magical time. Mm -hmm. That's why I just tell people that, that 20 to 30 is not the party years. Yes. That is the decade to build your careers, build your businesses, get your skill set. I don't care if it's an engineer, do your yes. schooling. Mm -hmm. You'll never have a special decade like 20 to 30. That's why I tell young people, don't get married in that decade. Don't yes. have children in that decade. Yep. Don't fuck up your life in that decade. Yes. I'm not saying don't have a little fun, but that's the decade to get your shit together. And set you up for the rest set of the, life. Yes. After 30, get knocked up. Yeah. Marry 10 people. I don't right. give a shit. Be yeah. Amish. Yeah. But, but not in that first decade. Mm -hmm. because, it's, it's, because usually in that decade, you don't have a lot of debt either. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right? You don't have a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. After 30, you're usually responsible enough. Now, you've got a mortgage. Yes. You've got car payments. You've got potentially kids. Yep. I can't tell you how many women walk up to me and say, I would love to be 20 and come through your academy. They message me about my internship all the time. Yes. If I could just go back in time if I didn't have kids, and not that they don't love their kids, I'm sure. but They if, don't love some of them, but anyway. But, <laughs> but if I could go back and do it again, I would kill for that yes. opportunity. And I try to tell people, like, I was the person. I was married when I was 21. You mm -hmm. know, I got married. And and it, he was a great person. There was nothing wrong with it. But our lives, my outlook on what I wanted to do completely changed, like yes. a complete 360. And it wasn't his fault. It, it was. And that's and that's why I tell people not to get married in that decade. I would tell him that. What, a what is times. important to you as a 20 year old is typically not that important to you as a 30. A hundred percent. Even though you might still love horses, but 
it's hard for people to say, you know, the two, you know, a 10 year old girl and a 20 year old girl don't think the same. Yep. And a 20 year old girl and a 30 year old woman don't think the same. And we, as a girl, yeah. we want to be rainbows and butterflies. We can, we can grow with our husband mm -hmm. and it's going to be all this. We, in my childhood and growing up, like I thought, oh, I'm going to marry a cowboy and we're going to go and have yeah. all these horses and it's going to be great. And that you just don't know when you're 21. No. You have a you freaking You don't even clue. know what you are. You have no freaking clue. Yes. So I wish everybody at 21 to 22 to 25 would just pull the reins up just a little bit yes. on that. Don't, you can have a relationship, but don't get hitched to somebody yet. Just and don't wait. have children because yes. they're too, especially children. Divorces, you can get divorced, but yeah. they're ugly. But, but children are a lifelong commitment. And they're great at, at a time. But, at a time. Yes. Yes. But after 30, you will have so much more maturity. You'll mm -hmm. know what you are. You'll know what you're not. And how many kids grow up in situations where they're paying the rest of their life for their parents having them in a time when they weren't prepared to have oh, kids? Yeah. I mean, that affects them the rest of their absolutely. lives. Absolutely. You know, uh, so. Uh, absolutely. Anyways. Okay, so so you're 21 now. Uh, you do graduate nursing or you I don't? do. I, I pass. You just barely. get your ass by then. I get right by. I pass with the 73, which is exactly what you needed to pass nursing See, school. See, that's funny. In high school, I knew I had to get like a C to not get an ass <laughs> kicking from my dad. Yes, and exactly. And that's what I got. Yeah, exactly. I just got just enough not to get an ass kicking yep. from my old man. That's yep. how I got through high school. Yes. yes. And so I spent, I lived in the, I had to tone back the lessons last um, semester of nursing school because I was about to fail. Yeah. So I literally lived in the library for about three months. Yeah. Yeah. Made it, took the NCLEX, passed, got, I, I don't know how I convinced the people in the ER to give me an internship because I told them I want to be a nurse for forever and I would love it. And I did want to work in the ER, so it was cool because I did my um, internships there, but graduated, had my job in the ER, married, I'm like, so life horses, is set. So uh, horses are not going to be a part of it then if you no, want to be a nurse? No, I am like... I know that as a nurse, I can work three days a week, 12 hour shifts, oh, okay. have the other four off. So uh, I'm like, okay. I can work. Oh, you were going to do both. And do both. Right, right, Maybe right. get rid of the lesson deal a little bit or yeah, tone it down, okay. but have my barrel horses, have my living quarters trailer, go okay. to the barrel races. I had this whole fantasy of what life was going to be like. Yeah. Okay. It Where it's going to be happy balanced. Yeah, that did not. <laughs> Good luck with that. So I. That's why alcohol was invented. Yeah, it, it was <laughs> not. It did not work at all. Ooh. So I go and start my ER internship. So I have to get rid of some of my lesson kids. But like in my mind, in nursing school, you know, I've made these really close friends, and I we're all like, when we graduate, like life is just going to be like, like you're like it's the ultimate. Like we're going to make so much money. Okay, so I'm thinking like I'm going to be rolling in the dough. I'm going to make thirty dollars an hour. I don't know why. <laughs> Because I'm over here making $6 an hour doing lessons. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. And my parents always preach to me, like, you need to have a job with benefits and retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Play I did all So my whatever. I did all that. Same. Okay. So I get through the ER internship. It is pretty cool. They have no help in there. This is like the start of the nursing shortage. So I get to do, like, all kinds of great stuff, like, right off the bat. Like, we're in the trauma rooms on day one. And that is right up my alley. So blood and guts and shit like that don't bother it you. It was fine. Like, yeah. I loved it. And, um... I had I worked around really great nurses and um, learned a lot. But then, like, once I felt like I was decent at it after a year, like, I could handle not everything, but a lot of what came in, I, I was bored. I was like, this is, like, not that cool. Yeah. Okay, so I've reached the cool point. You're, you're a red personality, and yeah. I've talked about the color code, and that's yeah. one of the downsides to red. Red's a go get -in, son of bitches. Reds build the bridges. Reds build the skyscrapers. But the negative, the reds, and I'm cursed with it, and I wish I wasn't, <laughs> Because I've got a double cursor that I'm red with a big chunk of yellow, and yellows are about fun. Mm -hmm. So when you add yellow, red, and yellow together, basically it means is once we've mastered it or we know we can do it, it becomes boring real quick. Hundred percent. So yeah. I'm bored. Yes. Like I'm going back to Australia for Christmas. I'm, I haven't been there for three years. I'm just going to go back for three days. I'm going to sit on a plane for 24 hours. Because I know I can go anywhere in the world for three days. Yes. And the fourth day, I'm going to want to blow my planes out. hundred percent. So I'd rather, the same way. I'd rather fly back every four months and sit mm -hmm. on a plane for 24 hours and go back for three months, three, sorry, not three, three days, days, every four or five months yes. for the rest of my life, then go once a year for 10 days mm -hmm. and for seven of those, six of those days, want to blow my brains out. I yep. finally just accepted that's the way I am. I don't like it, yep. but I just get bored quickly. 100%. So I can, I can identify with once yes. you've mastered it, 
you, the, the, the thrill of the chase is over. The thrill of the chase. It's almost a curse. It is a curse. Because and you it's go like through all that addiction. time and effort to learn that skill yes, set. Yes. And then you're like, fuck it, I don't want to do it anymore. It's, yes, it's, it's almost a curse. It's yes. like a drug addiction yes. to me, honestly. Yes. And I and I tell people that. And you learn about yourself, like you said, through your 20s. And now I I feel like in the last year or two, I finally learned that about myself. Yes. Like, the, oh, that I just get bored. And I've I, I've done the same thing. Yep. I've just quit beating myself up for it. It it's is what it is. the way I am. You're not going to change. Accept it. And just deal with it. Don't yes. don't feel guilty about it. Don't try to sit yourself into a box, fit yep. yourself into this mold yep. that everybody wants you to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, society is, is wants us to be in a certain mold in life. Mm -hmm. And when people don't fit that mold, it's terrible when you sit in that mold. Yes. Yeah. yes. So you quit nursing at that point? Yeah, so I... So I'm having, this is when I'm start trading some more horses. So I'm mm. buying these horses and putting them on Facebook. This is when Facebook is really beginning to evolve. This was eight years ago. Okay. So I am putting horses on these Facebook auctions. Okay. So like they're making real money sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, man. When you say Facebook auction, they can bid on them? Is okay. It so it's literally a picture on Facebook. This is what I was talking about. It was a little like of a, uh, it was a very odd way to do it. You know, like we have a picture on my solo select page. Back then it was mm -hmm. Low Rance Horses. There's a picture on it and you literally bid in the comments. Like in the comments. You put a comment in, and we would say it closes at 8 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday night, and we would do, like, in the comments, I would put, like, going once for 5000 to such and such. And then if somebody else's bid would come in, I would delete that and re-put it on there, going once. And there had to be no bids for two minutes or four minutes total before we'd close and, it out. And nobody's doing this at this point other than you? Is Alan that... Chappell was doing it a little okay. bit. Me and right. Alan were the two people doing it. Yep. So we both have our Facebook auctions. And, like, we're both doing pretty good at it. Yep. Like, there's a big need for it. And yep. people are digging it. Okay, so why, let me get back to that a little bit. This is where I'm just old and fuddy-duddy. But why is there a need for it? What 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 was because missing? What, Joe, what, 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 scrap, what itch did, did that thing scratch that made it successful? Because then it was still where you had to go to somebody's ranch to buy a horse or go to the horse sale. Well, at 8 o'clock, you're sitting there at night scrolling Facebook or whatever it was then. Mm -hmm. It was Facebook. And, and why not? You're like, this horse, you know, I could take decent pictures of horses. You're like, that's a really pretty horse. Yeah. There's a video of it right there. There's pictures of the front and back. You're making it easy. It's easy. It's like, that's why Amazon works right? so well. Right? It, it's just because like it Amazon. Because it makes it easy for you to and buy. And then it's it. like, underneath it says, we can help you arrange shipping anywhere. No, not a problem, you yeah. know? So we've got all that. And so we start, and I'm like making good money. Yeah. So I'm sitting in there one night. And I'm at uh, the hospital and we're, I have a Facebook auction going and my husband at the time is trying to run it. He's completely incapable of technology, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But he's trying his best. Yeah. He's doing yeah. his very best. And I'm calling him, I'm like, John, you're screwing this up. You are screwing this up. This isn't how this works. And I don't have time to mess with it because my patient's dying. So I need you. <laughs> I I'd let the son of bitch die and I'd sell the horse. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to handle this and I have to go. Okay, mm -hmm. so just handle it. So um, the na night I get home, and I don't remember what happened. It was a huge ordeal. I don't remember. Some Two people were bidding, and one was mad because they didn't get yeah. it, and, you know, whatever. So I'm like, I think I'm going to quit my job. And he's like, no, you're not. Like, you're not quitting your job. And so I tell my parents that, and they're like, no, you're not. So I just do it. I just, that night, at like midnight, I email the lady, and I'm like, I'm putting in my two weeks, and I'm pretty sure they're probably going to sue me because I'm supposed to have a contract with them for two years because they, like, pay you to go through these yeah. extra classes yeah, yeah, for the yeah. internship. But I'm like, well, I guess... I mean, in all fairness, if it costs me $13,000 to pay him back, then I'll just pay him back, yeah. you know? So it's I'm like, whatever. Decision. So it's a business decision. Like I've weighed that part out and I'm like, I can make more than $13,000 the next year. So I'll just pay him back if I have to and roll with it. So that's what I did. And but you, you had a level of confidence or was it a little bit scary to quit that job or? It was kind of scary, yeah. you know? And like people always say like, well, I It wanna... wasn't an easy decision. You no, had to think it through. but. But I am one of those people that I don't like to think things through a lot. Like when I say I think it through, I thought it through for an hour. Okay. And I just did it. Like mm -hmm. I'm a very, I want instant gratification. So when mm -hmm. I've, it's just like I woke up one day and said, I'm going to have a horse sale online. You know, like yeah. I think of it a second and then I'm like, let's just do it. I'm just going to do it. You yeah. know, so that's what I did. I just did it that night. The people at the hospital were like, you're an idiot. I can't believe you're doing oh, yeah. this, you know, whatever. So I do that. I quit. And, um, so then I really step up the horse selling game. Mm -hmm. Where are you living at this In point? Bowie. So we have a little place there. It's mm -hmm. this cute little barn apartment with four stalls that I've somehow turned into 12. Don't ask <laughs> me how. Okay. Love it. We have horses tied. Like my ex-husband hated it. We had horses tied everywhere. Like we had 
horses in the stalls. I have them split up by panels, and I have some sitting and that, outside. And that's another thing I'm just going to, you don't have to comment it, so I'll comment yeah. it for all the girls out there and boys now. Because <laughs> I'm the asshole, and I'll take the <laughs> If you are going to be fucking stupid enough to get married, <laughs> you better pick somebody that loves what you're doing. Yes. Because horses are a drug. It doesn't wear off. Yes. And people that don't have that drug will never get that drug. Never. It's either in them or it's not. Yep. I've always said that. It's yep. either in them. You technically should not have had the horse bug. Correct. But you got it. And I had Who it Who knows back. where you got it from, but you got it. And yep. it never left you. Correct. Your sister never got it. Your parents never got it. And mm -hmm. they never will. Mm -mm. And if you're going to marry somebody or get serious with somebody, man or woman, and you're in the horse business, they better love it too. The because if they don't love it, they yeah. resent it. Because and they're not going to change. Especially men. Men will resent the horse industry when their women are in it yeah. and the women are in the barn 14 hours a day and yep. he's sitting home by himself. Yep. And when a man sits home by himself enough, he simply says, what the hell am I with you for? Yes. If I'm going to be single and, or if I'm going to sit here in the dark by myself and make yes. my own dinner and do my own shit, yes. what do I need you for? Absolutely. I might as well go be single yep. and go do what the hell I want to do. So let that be a damn good lesson. Yes. If you think you're going to train ladies, train the bartender to, to be cool with the horse industry, it ain't going to fucking work. Well, and I think the biggest lesson I learned from that, like I said, he was not a bad person. No. But if I thought I was going to change him into liking that, yeah. that was my problem. That's I right. thought I thought I would change him and he would like it. He wasn't going to change me either That's from right. not liking it. It wasn't his fault. You can't change You're people. not going to change, change people. people. And if you will learn that and accept that in your relationships from day one, I yes. think it, you will have a much smoother life. And that's, again, getting back to the decade of 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. That's your time to go ride some ponies. Yes. The first horse I rode I thought was great. Looking back on it, it was a complete piece of shit. Mm -hmm. But it was better than riding my bicycle. Yes. It was better than walking on foot. Absolutely. But I didn't know that. But if you would have said to me, do you want to keep this horse forever? Is it valuable? Oh, my God, it's a million-dollar horse, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Because it's the only damn horse I rode. I thought my horse was so a winner. So the 20 to 30, again is a time to go ride some ponies. Yes. Figure out what you like. Figure out what you don't like. Figure yes. out what you're willing to tolerate. Figure out what you're not willing to tolerate. Yes. I, I know people get pissed at me when I say shit like, especially the religious people, they get pissed at me. But that's the reason why, you know, I made the stupid mistake. I got married at 21. Mm -hmm. I was married nine and a half years, yeah. which was nine years too much. Yes. Because I was determined I was going to make it work. I was determined I was not going to get divorced. I, my mother said marriage is a lot of work. you got yes. to work at it. Fuck it. If she says that, I'm going to work at it. Yes. The, really, the one good thing about me being miserably married for nine and a half years, I got a lot of work done. Yeah. Because as a man, when you're unhappy, you never go home. Yes. I lived in that barn 24-7. So mm -hmm. I, that was the decade. I was already on crack, but I yeah. had some crack and, and yes. some other drugs mixed in there because I didn't want to go home and talk to her. Yeah. I didn't want to go home and see her. Yeah. Because all I did is got bitched at and whined at. So right. I wanted to stay with what I loved, which was the horses. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying. You, you, that's the decade to figure out who you are as an individual. Mm -hmm. And it's also the decade to figure out what you're wanting from a partner. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the decade to figure that shit out. And if you want the key to your 20s and 30s, I think that's it, honestly. Yeah. I think that is the key. You work hard and you figure out what you want out of a partner and what you your real goals and are. And part of that is they're gonna change. they are going to change. And, you're, and not only that, Melanie, I'm a little older than you, but... But every decade, you will keep changing. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm 47 now. I guarantee at 50, I won't feel the same way I felt at, at 40. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and every decade, you will change. And it's, that's a good thing. And people either change together yes. or they don't. Yes. That, yes. you know, people get really mad at me, but fuck it, it's my podcast. I'll say what's on my mind. That's why I don't personally believe in marriage anymore. Yeah. Because I don't believe the concept of till death to us part. Mm -hmm. You mean for the next 60 years, if we develop, turn into completely different people, we got to keep trying to hate each other until we make it work? Yep. I, I, maybe you will be the same person you are in 60 years, but there's a good chance you're not. Right. We're going to make a gamble on that some bitch? Right. That right. In, in 50 years, me and you are still going to like each other? Fuck a duck. I wouldn't do on a business contract for 40 years. Yep. Would I sign a contract to start a business with you till, till one of us die, we're going to stay in it? Yeah. No, you'd say, you idiot, why yeah. would you do that? Yes. You, you know, so everybody is going to change. But you, but the closer you start together, mm -hmm. the better chance you've got yes. of it staying a little bit better. Because yes. most people that have got the horse bug stay with the horse bug. Yes. 
I know two or three people. And if people, they don't, they resent it. They resent you for taking them away right. from it. That's exactly right. They, I know two or three people that, that got burnt out on horses and got out of them for two or three years, but guess what? They always got back into them. Mm -hmm. they, they tried to go get a city job, drive a dump truck, work at Home <laughs> Depot, and then three years later, they're back training horses again yep. because it's a drug. It is. And as soon as you just recognize it's a drug and, and it's what you want to do, the better. Today's episode was filmed at and produced by Intercut Productions. Marketing by Stuart and Associates and organized and administrated by Down Under Horsemanship. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time, mate. Cheers.